Hello, hello, hello! My name is Artemis underscore anime, and today I am reading Chapter 7, Truth, of A Robin's Nest by Silver Mist Anime Lover. Hello everyone! I'm updating all my stories as a special Christmas gift to you all, or Queenza or Hanukkah. So, happy everything, and please enjoy! Also, I left a brief comment in the last chapter about All Might vs. Superman. Jesus, people, I did not mean to start World War III! It was Izuku's passing thought, not a serious debate, okay? So please lay off of me. I'm Switzerland in this. Chapter 7 Truth Shota hated hospitals with a burning passion. He hated hospitals more than he hated mornings without coffee. They were noisy, smelled like disinfectant far too clean, and there was no privacy. The only good thing about them was the excuse to sleep all the time. But even then, the shitty beds and cheap sheets made good sleep almost impossible. And the one time Shota tried to use his own sleeping bag, they tried to confiscate it. And he just knew he'd never see it again if he had let that happen. But even he had to admit that he was in a bad state, or had been before being brought to this hellhole. Even now, Shota was in pain, and he knew from an experience that they had him on some pretty heavy-duty painkillers. He'd been checked over several times, and though he felt like shit, he had every intention of going back to teaching when school let back in after they were finished up with the security updates. Because if he knew Nezu, they were going to be extensive updates, the kind that they shut down the school for. Hey, you're awake. Sashi smiled down as he came into the room. You scared the hell out of us, you know that? We were touch and go for a little bit. I'm fine. How soon can you spring me? He begged Hisashi with his eyes. <laughs> Same as ever, I see. He took a seat beside Shota's bed. School, as I'm sure you've already assumed, has been closed for three days while we were out to try and figure out a new way to keep that warp gate quirk out. A flash of blood crossed in his mind's eye. Midoriya. He locked his eyes with the blonde. How is he? Hisashi pulled the back of the small curtain on Shota's other side, revealing the form of a small boy. He was pale and covered in bandages, though not to the extent of Shota. His arm reassembled Shota's own mummified arms, and he had a thick bandage on his right cheek. He had several wrapped around his neck and a few around his head. Damn problem, child. He's very much alive, which is as impressive as hell. He scared all of us as much as you did. According to the other kids, he didn't hesitate to throw himself between you all and that villain. He scared me too. Shota shuddered as he recalled how helpless he'd felt as he watched that villain go after his kids. Speaking of, I hope you don't mind the interruption. Detective Tsukuchi stood at the doorway. Need my statement, Shota sighed as the man nodded. Let's start from the top, shall we? Tsukuchi waited for Shota to start. Now that I think about it, Midoriya mentioned when we got off the bus that he had had a bad feeling. He thought back to the kid's concern. He thought that maybe he'd been too tired or nervous. Shota, of course, hadn't simply written it off. The kid had experience fighting crime. But he hadn't realized that things would go south so quickly. I actually got a text from him, Hazashi blinked as he scrolled through his phone. He said he had a bad feeling and that if I couldn't get to you or him in 10 minutes to assume something was gravely wrong. When I couldn't get to your phones after those 10 minutes, I gathered the other teachers and went to find you. Then we ran into Ida partway there. We'd gone to the USJ for a scheduled lesson. The lights had flickered, and then the warp gate appeared by the fountain, Shota continued. I told Thirteen to protect the students before engaging the villains pouring out of the portal. I tried to keep an eye on the guy who looked like the most trouble, the one with the warp quirk, but the moment I blinked, he was gone. Korigiri is his name, Tsukuichi informed. After that, things just blurred into fighting, but then Shigaraki pointed out the intervals between my blinks was getting shorter and shorter. I attacked him, and he caught my elbow before using his quirk on it. He ordered that 
thing, Nomu, I think it was, to attack me. Shota shuddered hard, remembering the sheer strength of the beast. I was sure I'd erased its quirk. It didn't matter, though. It was too fast to see, too strong to fight. It snapped my arms like twigs and nearly flattened my skull into the ground. He noticed Tazashi turned a little white as Shota described just how overpowered he'd been. They called it the anti-symbol of peace, something made to kill all might. Tsukuchi stiffened as he wrote that down. Kuragiri returned not long after and mentioned a student escaping. Shigaraki talked about a game over or something before he mentioned dealing a blow to All Might's pride. Shota remembered the scene with a devastating clarity. Shigaraki had been going for Yatsu when Midoriya, just as fast, threw himself between them. I erased his quirk as fast as I could. The fear he'd felt when he thought he'd been too late. God, his eyes ached just remembering how hard it had been to erase that quirk. And he did not want his eyes to start watering now because if that happened, they'd start burning. And he couldn't put his eye drops in without the use of his currently mummified hands. And then it was a little hazy after that. I remember Atsushi and Kirishima moving me out of the crater. He recalled watching in stunned, horrified awe as Midoriya managed to somehow keep up with that monster's speed. Midoriya, he had no fear. Shota realized the words were wrong as soon as they escaped his mouth. He showed no fear, he corrected. He kept pace with that Nobu. It was as strong and fast as All Might in his prime. And he kept peace with it? Hizashi choked. Tsukuchi looked stunned too. While fighting Shigaraki, Shota nodded. Oh, okay. Nodding was bad. Nodding hurt. Fuck. He hated being injured. He took the pain with a laugh and mocked them. I think he was trying to draw their attention so that we could get to safety didn't seem like his first time he'd done so either. Most rookies make the mistake of looking over at the people they're protecting to assure themselves that they're safe. He didn't. It's because of that he was successful. And watching Midoriya's shoulder be disintegrated to the bone had hurt Shota as almost as much as he was sure it hurt Midoriya. Shota's heart had nearly stopped when he scarcely escaped having his neck disintegrated. And then, Nobu caught him by the arm. Shota shuddered, remembering how easily the beast had snapped his own arms, twisting and grinding the bones in its powerful grip. He was grateful for quirks without them. He probably wouldn't even have arms. Right now. He didn't cry out even as his arms broke, Shota recalled, remembering his blinding fear in that moment, that need to help his student. Even still, he laughed and mocked them, keeping their attention occupied. Damn, and I thought the kid was impressive before, and... Hizashi whistled. Detective Suguchi took a seat, looking unusually pale as Shota continued. Somehow, he managed to get some good hits in, one right between the legs, even while dangling from a broken arm. Shota smirked wildly. He wouldn't lie. Hearing the villain's squeak of pain as his manhood was attacked had made him grin in vicious satisfaction. His smirk faltered as he remembered how close Midoriya had come to dying. Shigaraki had been about to kill him, and that's when All Might showed up. He remembered the absolute relief he'd felt when he realized that the reinforcements had arrived. Yeah, Ida had rushed up right up to us when we were heading out towards you guys. He was scared as hell out of us. Thank goodness for Midoriya's text, otherwise it would have taken us a lot longer. The panicked look of desperation on his felt as he panted out the words, USK and villains? Class reps were ordered to bring the students to the bunkers. We had no idea if this had been an isolated attack or a distraction. I'd been under the assumption that it, of a much smaller attack, so I just brought whoever was in the lounge with me. 
Ida's words sent everyone else into action, and Nezu gathered up the rest of the staff himself. We didn't know if it was an isolated attack or not, either. For all we knew, the rest of the UA was also under attack, and that's why nobody had came. I am actually glad that it was just somebody chiming up the signal. Shota spoke quietly. God. Sho, do you realize how bad everything looked when we arrived? Thirteen was hurt and unconscious by the doorway. They're fine now, and you and Midoriya. Zashi remembered the scene clearly. His heart had been in his throat when he realized the students had been scattered, and he saw all the blood strewn throughout the square. He prayed that the blood belonged to the villains, and once he'd reached the top of the staircase, he'd seen the kids with Shota, and Shota looked like death. For a moment, he'd seen that collapsed building from the second year. He truly feared that Shota had left him alone with Namuri. It wasn't until he'd moved that he realized he was even alive, but holy fuck, Midoriya looked just as bad, and the kid was somehow still standing. Hey, stop that, Shota spoke up. He knew Hisashi's mind was going to be in a place it shouldn't be. Nobody else got hurt. Just you, Thirteen, and Midoriya. Everyone else is alive, Hisashi reassured him. Could have started with that, you know. But you needed to get that story off your chest, as Ashi pointed out, po gently poking his cheek. Tenchi's worried about you, too. He sends his regard. I'm guessing he's looking after his baby brother then? Shota smiled fondly. Of course he is. As Ashi shook his head. Remember when little Ida was born? I don't think I've ever seen someone come into their brotherly instinct so quickly. Still remember when the kid puked on me. Showed to grimace. You know, I don't think little Ida knows that we went to school with his brother, Hizashi mused. I mean, we see Namuri and Skenshiro all the time at work, but Tenshi decided to just go off with his own agency. If his brother wants to tell him, that's fine, but it's not our place to tell him we babysat him when he was an infant. Shota shook his head. Ow! Would you stop hurting yourself? Is all she asked, exasperated. If you get me coffee, you know I'm not allowed to do that show. I want to thank you for your statement today. Tsukuyuki was still seated, but and he was still somewhat pale, but he looked more collected than before. He glanced over to Midoriya. I'll come back when he's awake for his statement. He went to get up when they all heard a soft groan from the other bed. Shoto would later deny just how much of a relief it was to look over into the green, very much alive eyes. You took your time, problem child. He smiled softly. Let's both agree not to be angry at the other for nearly dying, yeah? Midoriya cracked a smile. Well, oh, this is new. I'm not used to hospitals. Didn't your mentor ever take you to get treated when you were hurt? Shota knew this kid had to have been hurt like this before. No, we had someone. Alfred was a trained military medic. There were extrusionating circumstances that prevented us from getting treated at hospitals for any injuries related to our heroic activities. So basically, you were both vigilantes and couldn't go to the hospital for fear of being arrested, Shota deadpanned. Yep, this kid was too damned happy. Though, after a while, I suppose we could have gone to the hospital. The police chief started calling us to handle the particularly insane criminals. Insane? Azashi blinked. Yeah, every now and again there'd be a breakout from the asylum of the criminally insane. He shrugged like this was no big deal. You're unbelievable. No wonder you could taunt them to so casually. Shota fought the urge to shake his head. Well, Shigaraki definitely had a few screws loose, but it was nothing compared to Cho- he cut himself off like he'd realized he'd said too much. Tsukuchi took this opportunity to clear his throat, alerting Midoriya to his presence. The kid paled a bit, an understandable reaction considering this man was in charge of capturing Robin. Forgive my intrusion. I'm Detective Tsukuchi. I know you just woke up, but I need your statement regarding the USK incident. Midoriya sent a glance at Shota, who sighed. 
We may as well settle this now, Tsuku Uchi. Hmm? Midoriya Izuku is my official apprentice. He is no longer a vigilante. Tsuku Uchi blinked, completely lost. Vigilante? You know me as Robin. A light smirk graced the kid's features as Tsuku Uchi startled badly. W wait You're the vigilante Robin? Yes. Yes, I am. And he's my official apprentice. So, he's now off the wanted list. Shota stated. So please make sure your men know I do not want my student getting shot by your team. Again, Midori muttered under his breath, and Shota fought the urge to press for answers. You can ask him later. They'll be informed. Though, I have to ask, how the hell did you avoid us for so long? You weren't even seen! Tsuguchi had an excited gleam in his eyes. I had a very good mentor, Midori smiled softly. You're 15, so you've been a vigilante since you were 10? Tsuguchi realized, and Shoto's own eyes widened. He never thought of it that way. Her, <laughs> yes? He smiled cheapishly, causing the two men to sigh and Hizashi to choke. Yes, well, I must inform you before taking your statement. My quirk is lie detector. I can tell if you're dishonest, so please try not to gloss over any details. Hi. Midori shifted a little. He's uncomfortable around him? Shota took note of that. Then, uh, I guess the place to start would be when we got off the bus. I had this horrible gut feeling I just knew something bad was going down, but I had no idea what. So I sent a text to the only faculty member in my phone and informed my sensei, but there wasn't much we could do other than try to be prepared. Midori shook his head. And then, Vilm showed up. I saw a sensei jumped right into the fray after telling Thirteen and I to protect the students. You told a student to protect them? Hizashi raised an eyebrow. He's a capable vigilante and a very promising hero with more experience than any student. It was only logical that he helped Thirteen. Shota defended his actions decisively. Honestly, even if he hadn't told me to, I would have protected them. Midoriya smiled softly. And then Karagiri came up out of nowhere, introducing himself as a member of the League of Villains. A shitty name, if you ask me. But I've seen worse. He scattered to us all around the buildings. And I barely snagged Sue and Iggy before we found ourselves with Mineta in the shipwreck zone. I managed to reverse hack the system and activate the whirlpool while having Mineta throw his sticky balls in the water, trapping the villains together and neutralizing the immediate danger. After that, we decided to rejoin the others via the entrance. I had to get them out of the building and to safety. You had to get to safety too, Shota narrowed his eyes. My safety is second to theirs. I can handle myself. They've never been in a situation like that before. They've never stared their own death in the face. The words Shota shiver, shiver down the spines of the adults. And you have? Shota was afraid of the answer. Of course. More times than I care to count. Something a lot of people didn't realize that Tsukuchi's quirk had to tell. Much like Shota's hair, whenever someone told a lie in his presence, his eyes would flash silver for a brief moment. So when Midori said that, he watched for it, and was horrified to find that the detective eyes stayed brown. Even Tsukuchi seemed shaken by this revelation. When I saw his always sensei being massacred by the Nomu, I wanted to help him badly, but I knew that doing so would draw attention to my classmates too. I couldn't risk their safety. I'm sorry. Was the kid seriously apologizing for not helping him sooner? You don't need to apologize. You made the right choice. Shota sent him an exasperated look. Well, it didn't matter anyways. When Shigaraki tried to erase Sue, I blocked it. And as soon as Aizawa-sensei erased his quirk, I broke his nose. Midori smirked. That was very satisfying. I'm sure. Hizashi shook his head blondly. I've been told you've managed to keep pace with Nanomu, a creature of who has speed like All Might, Tsukuchi inquired. Shoto would be lying if he said he wasn't just as curious. I had a friend when I was younger. His name was Wally. His uncle had some lab experience while beforehand and accidentally gave himself some super speed. The two of them were quirkless, and Wally replicated his uncle's experiment, giving himself the same power. Midori smiled fondly. There was a sad edge to the smile, though. We'd hang out all the time. 
His uncle was his mentor, and my mentor and his mentor were good friends, too. And being around the two fa of the fastest men to have ever walked on the earth tends to give you reflexes that are above average. Not once had Tsukuyuki's eyes glued. Damn, what the hell, kid? Your luck is like unlike anything I've ever seen. Tsukuyuki asked a few more questions about the Yosuke before he finally asked the question that caught the interest of Zashi and Shota. Who's your mentor? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. By detector or no. Midori shook his head, but Tsukuyuki's eyes flashed silver. You aren't going to get in trouble, and neither is your mentor. My mentor is dead, Midori spat, startling Shota. He's been dead for a long time. Tsukuyuki's left eye flashed silver, but his right eye stayed brown. What the- That's a- Lie? Tsukuyuki himself sounded confused. It's a lie for me, but a truth by fact. Midoriya looked up at the three adults in the room. My mentor was a vigilante who protected a city in the United States of America, known as Gotham. He took a deep, steadying breath and glanced at Shota for support. This kid has so much trust in me. He nodded firmly. His name was Bruce Name. Hero name? Batman. The name was familiar. Maybe he'd read about his work somewhere? This is where things get tricky, Midori chuckled bitterly. I met him when I was 11 years old, after my adoptive parents were murdered. He took me in and trained me after I discovered his identity. Adoptive? Tsukuki's eyebrows furrowed. As far as I know, your parents are still alive. They haven't been born yet. When I met the Graysons. He smiled softly, and to show the shock, Tsukuki's eyes stayed brown. What's that supposed to mean? Hisashi looked like his brain was frying. There are a couple of things you need to know. First, I'm quirkless. Tsukuchi nodded to Midoriya's statement. When I was nine, I got caught up in a villain attack. I got hit by an unknown person's unknown quirk, and it's not known if it was from a villain or a civilian, but it made me disappear for about a week. Again, only one eye flashed silver. Sorry. A week here. Both eyes stayed brown. I remember that case, Tsukuchi blinked. I was called in to help find you since I had dealt with so many different quirks. You showed up a week and a half or so after your disappearance. Reports said you'd undergone a severe personality change, but were otherwise unharmed. Yeah, well, Midori shook his, the back of his head. That quirk sent me back to, in time, to the year 2013, and I lived there until about 2020 when the after effects of my quirk sent me back to my original timeline and reset me to my original age. I retained whatever physical altercations and items I had on me at the time. Tsukuchi's eyes stayed brown, the kid was telling the truth. That makes so much sense, Shota sighed. Your unconventional fighting style, your experience and skills. You were 16 when you were sent back here? Yeah. It was sudden and terrifying. One moment I was helping Bruce research a few things and bantering with Barbara about whether or not Catman and Bruce would hook up, and then I just started fading, and, and I'd never seen them look so scared before. Midoriya crawled in on himself as much as his injuries would allow. And then I was back here in this time, and I was a kid again, and they were gone. And all of a sudden, I was the quirkless kid again. I was less than and alone, and everyone I cared about, everyone I fought for, protected with everything I'd had, dead. Suddenly, everything became clear. It'd been centuries for the world, but only a scarce few years for the kid. Shoto wanted nothing more than to scoop this kid into his arms and reassure him that things would get better, that the grief would ease little by little. Hisashi got up and carefully pulled Midoriya into a hug. The kid stiffened and looked up in confusion. Shota's in no state to get out of bed, so you'll have to settle for my hugs in the meantime. He smiled softly, gently running his fingers through the green hair. You aren't alone anymore, little listener. I don't care how long you've lived. You're still a kid right now. It's okay to be hurt. It's okay to cry. No one here will judge you for that. You can grieve. We understand. 
Apparently, that was exactly what Midoriya needed to hear, because he wrapped his good arm around the blonde and started to break down. Every heart-wrenching sob tore part of Shota's own heart out of his chest, and he wanted nothing more than to join Hisashi in giving the kid support. Fuck this, my arms are broken, not my legs. He bit down on his tongue and gingerly swung his leg over the edge of the bed. He noticed Tsukuchi giving him a reprimanding glare, but the man must have been just as effective, as he didn't stop Shota. In fact, the detective nodded his thanks and left the room, giving the three some privacy. Shota carefully made his way over to the two of them, before swinging a casted arm around Hisashi and Midoriya. The blonde's head whipped up in surprise before dissolving into a disapproving glare. You should stay in bed, he sighed angrily with the hand that wasn't running through Midoriya's head. Shota glared back, unable to respond in sign, with his hands reduced to mummified marshmallows. You're here, kid. You aren't alone anymore. Shota softly murmured to Midoriya, who glanced up in surprise. You remind me of him a lot, you know, Midoriya muttered leaning into Shota without pulling away from Hisashi. Unable to truly hug him, Shota tucked Midoriya's head under his chin. The soft locks tickled his chin, but the kid seemed to melt into the embrace, nuzzling into Shota's chest. You feel safe, like he did, strong and quiet. I don't know why, but I feel safe with you, Aizawa. Shota wouldn't admit it out loud, but that made him feel warm inside. A soft smile found its way onto his face. No matter what, you can count on me. We're a team now, yeah? It wasn't that a strange thought. Shota hadn't been a part of the te a team since Shikamaru. He supposed that he was a lot like Midori in that aspect. They'd both lost their teammates to death. Yeah, Midori smiled softly. His sobs eventually quieted and his breathing evened out. The listener fell asleep as Ashi chuckled. He looks so content and snuggled up to you. Take a picture and I will hurt you, Shota threatened as he saw Hisashi reach for his phone. I never want to see him cry like that again, Hisashi sighed. I agree. I never would have guessed that the kid went through so much. No wonder he's such a brilliant vigilante. He's been one for years, Hisashi agreed. That man. Shota's eyes narrowed before widening in realization. The Dark Knight. The legends had been passed down for centuries. Not many people remembered the old hero's actual hero name, and his civilian identity had never been discovered, and remained a hotly debated topic to this day. He was one of the most famous old heroes. He fought some of the most vile and twisted criminals, and he was quirkless to boot. Many old heroes had came into quirk-like powers through unconventional means, and had come across equally strong and powerful villains in their time. They had earned the trust of the people by protecting them, and many were still known to this day. Superman, Green Lantern, The Flash, wait. You think the hero Midori was talking about earlier was The Flash? You're shitting me! Hisashi whispered, excited at the prospect that his student had met Sashi's own favorite hero. To think, he's been trained by the Dark Knight though. Shoda smiled softly, before resisting the urge to hit his head onto something. Batman and Robin, the dynamic duo. Midoriya was his sidekick. Oh. Zashi's eyes were wide. Shota understood why. The old heroes were something like ancient celebrities, borderline gods depending on who you asked. Like how children looked up to All Might, many heroes looked up to the old heroes of the pre-court era. The ones who'd paved the way to heroism and forged the path for followed to this day. Their teachings spread by word of mouth and from whatever surviving documentations remained were held in high regard. UA second years had an entire class dedicated to the study of old heroes. Shota supposed that Midoriya wouldn't exactly need to take that class considering he was an old hero. And that thought made even Shota excited. The Dark Knight had been his favorite of the old heroes, and to know his own apprentice was the sidekick of his favorite hero, it made him, internally, Kitty. He felt that childlike wonder fill him before shaking his head. Ow. No matter what, Midoriya was Midoriya. He was his student, his apprentice. The kid was the same kid that snarked off to villains that scaled the sides of UA for shits and giggles. 
and Chip made sense. Because Gotham was known as the most dangerous places in the world during the pre-quirked era. And only the Dark Knight and Robin had managed to keep things anything close to peaceful. He would try not to treat Midoriya any differently, but he knew that would be impossible. Because he was more hid than his student now. They were, in terms of experiments, equals. And Shoto was going to treat him as such. Yes, he was a kid, and Shoto would continue to teach him, but the kid had as much real battle experience as any seasoned hero. More so than most, actually. And Shoto was not going to baby him out in the field. He laid back in bed, careful not to wake the sleeping child. He shifted to get a little more comfortable. Weeks later, Shoto would demand Hitachi delete the picture of a mummified Shota curled protectively around a small, green-haired child whose head was tucked securely underneath his teacher's chin. Hisashi would do so after sending the copy to every faculty member of UA. And that was chapter 7, Truth of A Robin's Nest by Silver Mist Anime Lover. Thank you all for listening, and I will see you next time. Bye!